So my name is Jenny Cohane, and I study public memory, which combines my interest in history with the focus on rhetoric and communication. So let's start by talking about what public memory is. It's the process by which a society creates a shared history and communicates it to the public. It exists in museums and memorials. It also exists in the shared stories that we tell, um, such as the one about George Washington being unable to tell a lie. But it's important because it underlies what we might call our civic imaginary. It tells us what's important to us as a society. Unsurprisingly, it often relies upon what we might call grand or hegemonic narratives of the actions of white dudes. Flashback to the Red Talks 2018, I argue that the National Museum of American History, and specifically the exhibit on the First Ladies, framed the role of the First Lady in glamour, which depoliticized, domesticated, and ultimately limited her role in history. So I'm specifically interested in how we talk about and remember women's history. So my case study for today, then, is the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument, which is a very different type of place than the Smithsonian. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the house. Uh, it's the oldest house on Capitol Hill. It was purchased by the National Women's Party in 1929, and it became the residence and office of Alice Paul, who was a Quaker suffragist, the one who orchestrated the massive 1913 suffrage parade. And it ultimately became the headquarters of the NWP, or one of the groups central to getting the suffrage amendment passed, as they undertook a decades-long effort to pass the Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. In 2016, President Obama transferred partial ownership of the Belmont Paul House to the National Park Service as a way to share the cost of maintaining the house, which the NWP was struggling to do. So, it's an important spot for understanding women's history in Washington, D.C., and it's the closest we have to a museum for women's history, although, of course, that would be a partial history. So my project then looks at the communication strategies in the Belmont Hall House, such as the plaques, the curation, the stories that exist there, and highlights the rhetorical labor of public memory, the work that goes into curating this history. And I argue that that has an important meta-narrative that tells us about the challenges of preserving women's history. So, on one hand, compared to the Smithsonian's especially, the Belmont Paul House is shabby and underfunded, uh, but I want to argue that there's more going on there, that the strategies are both a material necessity, a long-engendered tradition, and a unique statement on the challenges of preserving feminist history. So I want to talk specifically about two strategies, retrofitting and calling attention to absence. So, Retrofitting, in my mind, refers to the tension between the house's role as, whoops, as a house and its role as a museum. So certainly it's important that the house exists and that women were able to hold and own this property, which was incredibly rare at the beginning of the 20th century. It's a beautiful house. It's uh, august and significant. But it's also not on the National Mall. Um, and that's a good thing for the women using the house because it put them very close to Congress and meant that they could go lobby. But it also means that because it's not on the National Mall, it gets fewer than 6,000 visitors a year. Um, yes, yeah, so it's there. Um, I couldn't figure out how to take away the thing that says where I live. And I promise you, I didn't do this research just because I'm a block away from the Belmont Paul House. Um, in terms of the rest of the retrofitting, Turning a house into a museum means uh, reckoning with sort of big, empty corners that you can't find stuff to fill the spaces. It means that there are large fireplaces that eat up space. There are wooden doors that are warped by humidity and popped open, revealing uh, stacks of archival material. There are these quaint little signs on fireplaces that point the way to the restrooms. Um, so it's a very different kind of experience than going to the Smithsonian's. One of the other things that the Belmont Paul House does is it calls attention to absence because we've tended not to save things used by women due to the long history of associating women with domesticity and believing that their artifacts aren't worth very much. So in this example, the Belmont Paul House calls attention to the ratification banner that women would sew stars on when different states ratified the suffrage amendment. No one knows where that went. Um, and so they call attention to the fact that we don't have this artifact. 
Likewise, um, there are some sort of tensions in relating to the role of black women with the National Women's Party, and these absences limit the stories that we can tell. Black women are represented only in sort of two banners that are added as an afterthought and marked as the work of interns. So, sort of a tension there. So to conclude, I want to argue that studying the labor and process of public memory is significant because it tells a meta-narrative of women's history and the struggle to keep it alive. And the challenge to secure space and artifacts related to women's long exclusion from the founding narratives of our history is something that public memory scholars should pay attention to. Thanks.